Well, if you have a Bible with you this morning, we're carrying on in the book of James. Uh, This morning our reading is from James chapter 2, and Angus will come and read for us. Thank you. Today's reading is from from James chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes to your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here is a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and became judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are, poor, who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonoured the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the, lo- the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbour as yourself, you are doing right. Um, but if you show favoritism, you, are, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be given and shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Father in heaven, will you help us now as we study your word? Help us to see ourselves as you see us. Help us to see others as you would have us see them. And may our lives point people to your great love. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. When we were studying through the book of 1 Samuel not too long ago, we finished up in 1 Samuel chapter 16. That is the chapter where famously Samuel is told to go to Bethlehem and there he will appoint a new king, a man that God will reveal to him when he gets there. And if we hadn't just studied that chapter only a few weeks ago, I'd have us turn there this morning because it's the perfect starting point for what we're looking at in the book of James. Samuel famously turns up and he sees a man who looks like he's got all the hallmarks of a great king according to his outward appearance. So he's a man who looks strong and powerful and confident and competent. And Samuel thinks, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before me. And the Lord says to him, I have not chosen him. And on and on Samuel goes through all the sons of Jesse until eventually he arrives at dinky little David, the shepherd boy of the family, the least likely among them, and God says, anoint him. He will be the next king of Israel. And so God kind of summarizes that story with this statement, a well-known Bible verse. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now that is supposed to be more than just a a nice, neat little saying to summarize the story. That statement should affect us. It should change the way we see things. It should change the way we make judgments about people and about circumstances and about the world in which we live. If we are a people who want to see the world as God sees the world, then we should care more about the heart than the outward appearance, obviously. And so this passage in James should help us to do exactly that. The first thing that we need to recognize, though, is that we are all susceptible to a misleading impression. We are all easily led astray and deceived by an outward appearance. So in the book of 1 Samuel, for example, um, why is Saul so disappointing? Because he looked like he should have been great. Why is David so surprising? Because he looked like the least impressive in his family. Why is Goliath so terrifying? Because he looked utterly unstoppable. And in every single instance and many more beside, the looks were deceiving. (laughs) There was more than meets the eye. We all get into trouble when we judge people according to the outward appearance. And that is what 
this passage in James chapter 2 is talking about. So from verse 1. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here is a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit on the floor by my feet then have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, I reckon we are keen to jump into that wonderful example that James gives us of the rich man and the poor man and how each of them might be treated in the gathering of God's people. But before we jump into that particular example that James holds up before us, we've got to ground everything we see in verse 1. Without seeing the importance of verse 1, the rest of the passage is good advice at best. Verse 1 is so utterly important for our understanding. Now, without looking down, what did verse 1 say? See, easily we can gloss over kind of religious language that sounds good and right and appropriate because it doesn't jump out at us as needing special mental attention. Verse 1 is the soil where this teaching must find its roots. And it's utterly important that we study this verse first. So listen again. My brothers and sisters, not my fellow churchgoers or my weekend acquaintances, but my brothers and sisters, family, flesh and blood, family. That is who we are to one another. What wouldn't you do for your family? How far would you go to serve and to save your family? Now, of course, family relationships can break down, as church relationships can break down. But this should be our default state, to see each other with this kind of unity, bonded to one another for life, through all the highs and lows, as you are with your family. In fact, Christian family is even more significant than that. You are bonded to one another, not just for life, but for eternity. You will share heaven with the people in this room. And so it matters how you treat one another, don't you think? All this teaching about the rich man and the poor man, it matters because you are family with these people, not merely acquaintances with them. So firstly, the soil of this truth to take root in is the soil of relationship and love and unity among God's people. (laughs) Secondly though, that idea of family, it ought to bring up in us a kind of recognition of our own spiritual poverty. You were not born into this family, you know that? (laughs) You were brought into this family. It is a gift of God's grace that you are part of this family. Listen to these lyrics from a modern hymn and one of my favorites. Listen especially for the language of family. I was an orphan, lost at the fall, running away when I'd hear you call, but Father, you worked your will. I had no righteousness of my own. I had no right to draw near your throne. But Father, you loved me still. And in love, before you laid the world's foundation, you predestined to adopt me as your own. You have raised me up so high above my station. I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone. That's it. That's the gospel. A pure gift of God's grace. You are in the family of God, not because of your strength or your skill or your superiority. And so there must be just utter humility among the people of God, don't you think? That's what it means to be able to call yourself a son or a daughter of the living God. A brother or a sister of Christ himself and the other believers in this room. You were born as an outsider. You were born as an enemy. You were born as someone who rejected the grace of God and yet you have been brought in by his amazing grace. My brothers and sisters, that is who's being addressed here. Believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. This is more than a suggestion from James, isn't it? He doesn't say, shouldn't really show favoritism. He doesn't say, really should Keep favoritism to a minimum. He says, no, you must not show favoritism. This is not optional. Why? And then we'll come on to that 
beautiful example of the rich man and the poor man. But why? Because it is directly opposed to the gospel. You were shown grace when you didn't deserve it. And that is how you should treat all other people as well. Let's pause just for a moment because um, I think it's helpful to make a distinction between uh, favoritism and friendship. You have favorite people in your life, obviously. You have presumably a group of people who you would call your friends. You might even have a best friend. On Thursday in the church, we had a marriage here. Matthew and Harang got married, and nobody accused either of them of favoritism for choosing one another. In fact, it is a very good thing. Is this teaching from James that we must not show favoritism, is it a teaching that we cannot have friends? (laughs) Should we organize our lives on a rota-only basis and give everybody that we know the same number of phone calls, invitations, encouragements, and smiles? Is that what James is advocating? Well, clearly the answer is no. Friendship, genuine biblical friendship, is an extraordinarily important thing. I think it's actually something that is undertaught on, and we'll be able to go through friendship when we look at David and Jonathan later on in the book of 1 Samuel. Think of that um, wonderful friendship between David and Jonathan. It was a good and godly thing that they had each other as favorite, best friend. At 1 Samuel 20, listen to this. Jonathan said to David, go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord. Sworn friendship? Have you sworn friendship with anybody? It's an amazing depth of relationship these two have, and it is a good and godly thing. I think of uh, Paul, who had a deep friendship with Timothy. Think of Ruth and her devotion to Naomi. Think of Jesus, even, who routinely calls out of the twelve Peter, James, and John and gives special time and attention to them. Is this favoritism we're seeing? Well, no, it's friendship. And it's always seen as being a very good and godly thing in the Bible. So what is the difference? Here is the key distinction, okay? Favoritism is discriminating between people based on the category they belong to. Okay? Let me say that again. Favoritism is discriminating between people, accepting or rejecting people, based on the category they belong to, rather than the content of their character. So, for example, accepting or rejecting people based on their uh, social class, or their skin color, or their race, or their income, or the country they grew up in, or the sports team they support. (laughs) To treat somebody according to the category they belong to, rather than according to the individual that they are, that is a sin according to the Bible. Now, friendship does not fall into that particular error. Friendship treats people as individuals, doesn't it? A friendship breaks all kinds of boundaries and crosses all kinds of categories. In fact, now I find this especially interesting. Think of those examples that I gave, biblical, good, godly friendships just a moment ago. See how they um, don't fall into this trap of favoritism. How if either of these people were guilty of favoritism, these friendships could not have taken place. For example, Jonathan was an insider, son of the king. David was an outsider, son of a nobody from the backwaters of Bethlehem. In fact, more than that, Jonathan would have inherited the kingdom of Israel from his father, if only his father hadn't been so sinful and squandered it. And yet it ends up going to David. Now, if either of these people had written the other off because of the outward appearance or because of the circumstances they are set within, they would never have been friends, not in a million years. And so... They were friends with each other because they were individuals who loved each other greatly. Same with Ruth and Naomi. That one's obvious, isn't it? Uh, Ruth is a Moabite, Naomi an Israelite, two people groups that traditionally hated each other. And yet, do you see Ruth's devotion to Naomi? Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Have you ever seen friendship like that? It breaks the boundaries. It crosses the categories. It is unexpected. That is how you know favoritism is not at play. So to be clear, no, it's not wrong to have friends, (laughs) favorite individuals in your life. You will have people that your personality clicks with in a special way, and that is a good and godly thing. But... Here's a little thought experiment you can run in your own mind. Think of your friends. Look around your friends in your mind for a moment. 
if all your friends look like you and talk like you and have your kind of income and have your social class, if they all have your skin color, if they all have your interests, if they all have your accent, if they're all essentially just like you, it probably means something. Not definitely, but probably means you are quick to write off people who belong to other categories. You're slow to have patience with people who are a little different from yourself, perhaps. There is a danger there, and it's worth paying attention to. Even here at Moordown, and even you in your own life, or else James wouldn't bring it up for us, would he? If all your friends are basically just like you, well, it could be a sign that you are unintentionally, perhaps, guilty of the sin of favoritism and writing people off because they belong to a certain category. It is no small thing that when God gives us a glimpse into heaven, when we see in the book of Revelation what heaven looks like, it is full of people from every tongue, tribe, nation, and language. There is beautiful diversity, but there is not division. And that is a wonderful thing. That brings glory to God, that all these different kinds of people are united by the blood of Christ. You know, it, it, it uh, helps me to understand something, this book of James. It's something that I've been thinking for a long time but have not been able to articulate. I don't think it's a good thing for the witness of Christians to the world that we have churches that are based around people's differences or preferences rather than just their pure theology, what they believe to be true. I don't think it's a good thing that we have this church for young people and this church for old people and this church for black people, and this church for white people, and this church for people who enjoy that style, and this church for people who enjoy that style. What does that say about Christians when we fall into those kind of categories among ourselves? What does it say to the watching world? Well, that we care just as much about difference and preference as everybody else. That we are just as tribal, just as divided, just as prejudiced as the rest of the world. It's not a good witness. What is a wonderful witness is when all kinds of people who are different in all kinds of ways are united by their love of the Lord Jesus Christ and their desire to worship him, are willing to lay down their preferences for the good of others. And so we rejoice, and we should rejoice, when we see in one church like this, men and women, married and single, young and old, black and white, rich and poor, united as family, brothers and sisters, in Christ and forming individual friendships that cross all kinds of categories and break all kinds of barriers, but together as one people seeking to build the church and reach the lost and bring glory to God. That is a wonderful thing. And that is our aim here at Moordown. And we ought to pray for it and thank God when we see it. I think we are seeing more of it for what it's worth. Now then, back into James. James provides us with a specific example of how somebody might be treated purely on the basis of their category rather than their character. The rich person versus the poor person. Verse two, suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here is a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So the person who is obviously, outwardly wealthy is afforded special treatment among God's people and the poor person is all but discarded. By the way, I've been thinking this week, which is the best seat in the house? (laughs) Ever wondered that? Which is the most preferable one? Is it the one at the front? Apparently not. Maybe it's the one at the back or somewhere wedged in the middle. Evidently, in former times, there was a seat of honor or an area of honor, and it would be sorely tempting to give that place to the wealthy visitor. Now, I think we are unbelievably skillful at justifying our own sin. I think we are all very, very good at doing that. And it struck me when we were studying 1 Samuel just how quick Saul was to justify his own sinful behavior. Do you remember, he was told by God to kill all the animals belonging to the Amalekites, and he didn't. He kept some. He kept the best, in fact. And when confronted on that sin by Samuel, he said, yeah, I did keep the best, but it was so that I could sacrifice them to God. And I remember thinking, if I was Samuel, I might even be persuaded by that. 
It sounds like a good enough reason, doesn't it? Now, of course, God saw right through the excuse and the disobedience, and God confronted him over it through Samuel. But of course, we are all expert excuse makers, all of us. (laughs) And we can even apply religious reasons for the things that we do. You can imagine saying, oh, this obviously wealthy person has such great resources. Think of the blessing they could be to us here at Moordown. Think of the gifts they could give. Think of the difference they could make. And so, for the sake of the gospel, I'll pay special attention to them. And what about the poor person who comes in on the same week? Well, I can't be in two places at once, can I? (laughs) Someone else can deal with them. What about the person who wanders into church and you think to yourself, ah, looks like they're going to be hard work. And we don't have much in terms of relational bandwidth anyway, do we? We're, we're already stretched a thousand different directions. We're stretched pretty thin. What if I get alongside that person and they're just always asking for help? <laughs> what if they're just a constant drain on me and my resources? No, no, this person would be much better served at the church down the road. <laughs> you know, the big one with lots of resources. Or even the small one. <laughs> they can give a more personal touch. But just kind of anywhere but here. Now, we can justify those kind of things with religious language, but of course, God sees right through it. No one would ever say those things, of course, but it only takes a second in our minds. Earlier in the week, I stumbled across, researching for this sermon, stumbled across the old Church of England practice of pew renting. Have you heard of pew renting, by the way? It's a genuine thing, and I only found out about it uh, this week. From the 1800s, many Anglican churches started renting out their pews as a way of making money. So in a day and age when it was important to be seen to go along to church, when it was the done thing and culturally important, uh, churches started reserving seating for the rich, those who could afford it, had surplus money for these kind of things, so that they could buy something like a season ticket to a certain part of the church. (laughs) And these pews, they were called box pews. So they were literally boxed off, wooden boxes around them, with a a sort of wooden door at the end of the row, and in some cases, a key for that door. (laughs) So that if you were not there, no one else could use your pew on that given week. Unbelievable, don't you think? Given what we've literally just read in James chapter 2. And ministers all over the country stood up and preached the gospel. (laughs) And presumably somebody opened up James chapter 2 and read that example of the preferential seat being given to the rich person. And presumably people in those rich seats nodded their heads piously and thought, yes, how very profound. (laughs) It's embarrassing, isn't it? Just how blind we are to our own prejudices. Now, we're not guilty of that particular sin at Moordown. But that doesn't mean that we don't have our blind spots. We don't have our weaknesses and we don't have our errors. We've got to be aware of the danger of riches in the world. That is the specific example James puts his finger on, and so that's where we'll go as well. Now, it's not a sin to be rich. (laughs) Let me make that very clear so the one or two of you can breathe a sigh of relief. (laughs) There are examples in the Bible of people who are wealthy and godly, and their godliness dictates how they use their wealth and their resources and everything else in their life. Abraham was incredibly wealthy and godly, and he was generous. Job, wealthy and godly. Think of Joseph of Arimathea, who gave his tomb so that Jesus could have an honorable burial. Wealthy and godly, entirely possible. But it is worth saying to the rich person, as James carries on in verse 5, there are particular dangers in life for you. Money is essentially power, isn't it? In one form, these little coins, these little tokens in your pocket can be traded in for action in the real world. Difference made in your favor or in somebody else's favor to kind of get things to go your way. And so many problems, not all of course, the most serious problems can't be solved with money. But many problems can be. (laughs) And if you have the means and you're willing to trade in those tokens for that change that you want to see, well you can have certain things go your way in life. So sometimes, not always, But sometimes, uh, wealth breeds a kind of pride, a kind of arrogance, a kind of self-sufficiency even, a kind of um, state that separates the wealthy person from other people and even from God. You think of the rich young ruler who just wouldn't relinquish his wealth even though he knew it was keeping him from eternal life, couldn't let go of it. Think of Jesus saying, it is easier for a camel to enter through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. Think of that famous verse in 1 Timothy chapter 6. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. 
It does seem, from what we see in James here and elsewhere in the Bible, that God gives special grace, often though not always, special grace to those who are poor on earth. Think of Jesus saying, I've come to bring good news to the poor. Those who don't have much good news on earth in other realms, well, they have this good news, real riches, riches in heaven. They are available to you. The riches of God's grace poured out upon you, treasure that cannot rust or be destroyed. It is available. Think of Mary, the mother of Jesus, who said, God has turned the rich away empty and has given the hungry many good things. So perhaps it's fair to say that those who are most poor, most vulnerable, most on the margins of society are sometimes those who are most aware of their own weakness, most aware of their own need, and therefore most likely to call out to God. Either way, James says, look, it's an extraordinarily foolish thing to give preferential treatment to the rich at the expense of the poor. It's spiritually foolish. It's even practically foolish. Look at verse 6. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Isn't it the rich who are dragging you into court, trying to squeeze the money out of you like wringing water from a towel? (laughs) Isn't Isn't it them who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? The rich who are arrogant, proud of their power or their position, such that they have no humility even before God and blaspheme the name of him to whom you belong. Be careful, James says, about showing preferential treatment to anybody because of the category they belong to, and you'll be tempted to do it especially for those who are rich. While it's absolutely possible to be wealthy and godly, wealth is not a sign of godliness, and wealth is not a sign of spiritual maturity, and wealth is not a guarantee of wisdom. In fact, the wealthy and godly person will not want preferential treatment in the church, will not seek additional influence because they have power, will not expect to be treated differently because of it. So it's worth saying, if you find yourself uh, in the in crowd, in the powerful position, especially in terms of wealth, but there are lots of other scenarios in which you are in the powerful position, if you're in the majority when faced with the minority, if you have the power when someone else is weak, it is worth thinking about. How do you use that power? How do you use that position? Whose good are you seeking with the advantages that you have? We'll be thinking more about that together this evening. Okay, as we close then. How do we respond to those who would say, as many people did during times of great racial segregation, birds of a feather flock together, don't they? That's what they would say. And so what does it matter if I stick around with people like me? What does it matter if I can't really be bothered getting to know people who are not like me? Well, James will not let you get away with that attitude. (laughs) Verse 8, he says, If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not commit murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Now, what on earth is James talking about here? He's talking about the simple tendency that we all have of minimizing our own sin. We all tend to say, well, if it is a sin, it's a small one, and therefore not really worth worrying about. Whereas James says, no, if it is a sin... If it is a sin at all, then it's a breaking of God's law. And if you've broken God's law, you are deserving of death. The wages of sin is death. It's a bit like this. You're about to have lunch uh, in not too long uh, a time. If you could take your lunch plate in an hour or so's time and smash it in half, (laughs) you could say the majority of the plate is just fine, right? (laughs) It's just one smash in the middle, just a few millimeters wide. Uh, The rest of the plate's fine. Any sensible person would say, well, to break the plate in one place is to break the plate entirely. In the same way, to break God's law, even in just one place, is to break God's law entirely. And therefore, to be guilty of favoritism is to be deserving of death under the law. Someone might deserve death for committing murder, another for committing adultery, and someone else for committing the sin of favoritism. It's all part of God's law. And to break any part of it is to break it all and to incur the judgment that is deserved. Ah, well, that's worrying then, isn't it? (laughs) Because which one of us would say that we haven't broken any of God's laws, that we are utterly innocent of all wrongdoing 
Now, we've all sinned and fallen short, haven't we? Even in this area of favoritism, haven't we all on occasion written somebody off because of the category they belong to? Just thought, oh, I can't really be bothered making that kind of effort, crossing those kind of cultural boundaries. Yeah, we've all sinned. And so what hope is there for people like us, people who have failed in this way and many other ways besides? What hope is there? Well, the hope is found in the fact that Jesus did what we could not. That he did not stay distant from those who are different, but he drew near. Instead of writing us off, he lifted us up. Instead of consigning us to destruction, he went to the cross. And instead of treating us like failures, he treats us as his dearest friends. That is grace and his undeserved kindness. That Jesus would die so that those who were outsiders might become insiders. (laughs) Those who were distant might be brought near. Those who were far off might be made part of the very family of God brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so our hope is not found in our future better performance. Our hope is found in Christ. When we look at him, and when we fix our eyes on him, and when we get a hold of what he has done for us, it changes us. It makes us more gracious towards others. It makes us more loving towards others. It will enable us to do the same in some small way for the good of others. No, we're not crossing the boundary of heaven and earth to reach those who are different. But we might cross the boundary of our street, don't you think? (laughs) Or the boundary of one side of the room to the other to reach someone who is different and distant or lost and lonely. No, we're not going to be the people laying down the glory of heaven for the sake of others, but we might lay down our differences and our preferences. We might lay those things down for the good of others (laughs) so that the community of Christ here at Mordown would truly be a place where all people are welcome to worship the one true God. Let's pray that he will help us in that aim. Father in heaven, we thank you that you sent your son. And we thank you that your son came willingly and joyfully to those who were not just a little bit different, those who were utterly defiant in sin and hostile towards him. And yet he loved us and he gave himself for us. May his love melt our hearts and shape for us how we love one another. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.